Tape. We didn't finish this, the inner tip, so let me get cracking here. First thing I need to do is recess this, remove this piece of wood so that this will fit in a little slot right in the edge of the wing tip. Again, the first half of this was on the previous tape. Well, I just laid out what I thought would be the rough. It's either going to come out on this angle, and I just tried to interpolate. What I'll do is I'll just cut this piece of wood out for now, just to give me some starting point. I'm going to go at this little by little because I don't know how much. I just want to have enough that I can go down. And the readouts are going to come out, and I don't know how far until this is all put together. I'm assuming it's going to run into a flat here, so I'll just try to work this area here into a flat. Step is to figure out where this actual notch is going to be and just cut that notch out. Now we have some idea where that that's going to line up. Um, Open that slot up just a little bit. Now I tack glued that in. I want to make sure. See, I need to leave just enough room in here because the washers need to slide inside. I can't. I can't put this piece bolt buck, buck right up against that, or the washers catch on it. So I need to leave just a little clearance here for the washers. These pieces just laid in here. What I wanted to make sure, because the washer has to slide up into this little notch, and I need to put the bottom piece on here yet, I want to make sure I have full adjustment. That's what happens, they hang up on little little dribbles of glue and stuff. In fact, I got one right there, I have to get just get the glue out of there. And it slides in the back here. See where here's where it's hitting right here. But I want to make sure I have the full range of motion on both of these. True story, and this, this is not funny. There was a time when I did glue this on another plane back to the wing and some glue dripped down in here. And I didn't check this until I already, you know, had the, the wing, the doped and sanded area, and I had to cut in and get in there and gouge it out. So I'm going to be real careful here that I don't get any anything that's going to be sticking to this. And I was even thinking maybe putting a, uh, I don't know, some wax or something on there. So even if it does stick, but even if it does stick, I could cut the tip off, I guess. I'll just be real careful with the epoxy that none drips down in here. Because normally this would be in the middle of the wing. But this is in an awkward spot here. Now what I wanted to do, because I, I don't care about this yet, but I wanted to put, when I laid this down flat, it looked like this would be fine and I wouldn't be rubbing on this. But what I would like, because eventually the wire is going to rub on this, is to lay out a piece of 64th plywood on here, just so it doesn't wear a slot or a hole in there, hopefully. Uh, or if it does, it'll just minimize by just scratching the paint. I was going to do some edging here or something. I'm going to do this all with 64th plywood. I laid in a piece of 64th plywood this, just to give this some support. I guess I'm going to make two little pieces for the corner here just to cover these up. That'll give me a nice edge around the whole part. Again, what I'm looking for is just to make to make this as uh, durable as possible. And I know those wires are going to be flapping around and everything. And that's probably all I'm going to be able to get, to get done tonight. We have snow falling and houses to shovel. Now I'll have to figure this, how I want to join this tomorrow. Give me some time tonight to think of. I need to cut some foam out of the wing where the bolts are going to ride. And of course I want to hollow these parts now and get them as, as reasonably thin as I can without making them, that they're not going to retain their shape. 
and I hope this little plywood piece is going to be some value to me here in, in terms of durability. Anyway, there's only so much you can do every day. We got a good day in today. Now, last night when I was doing the email, I had a phone call. Somebody wanted to know, and I thought this would be a great time to explain this because this is the kind of thing you don't see written about in stunt news or and we're actually working on wingtips right now so it's, it really applies the two possibilities that seem very common are you build a plane with a larger inboard panel or equal panels now both have advantages and disadvantages that no matter how you look at this and it's it's difficult to explain this in a way that makes sense but the seat of the pants that I've experienced over the years is whenever I've made an equal panel ship the advantage for me was it would carry more tip weight now believe it or not a lot of the logic in our events sometimes sometimes it gets lost on people that think part of the problem but don't think the whole problem they don't see the big picture now let me give you an example virtually every plane I've ever had I'd like to have a little more tip weight I'm a person who loves to have the plane feel solid at the end of the lines some people don't they like that feathery light feel and they're willing to back up and jump around and, and do the mambo at the end of the handle I don't I like to be perfectly stationary so I've chosen most of the planes that I've designed I've tried to get make a tip weight box that's plenty big because they usually wind up with a decent amount of tip weight. Now, that's not the only way to do this, and I don't want to leave the impression that, that if you don't do it my way, you know, you're not you're not really uh, right up on the 20th century. But what happens with unequal panel planes, and th the argument has gone on for years. They they definitely there's no question about it, they will not carry the amount of tip weight or give the solid line feel that an equal panel plane would. Now our plane is equal panel, but it also we have to take into account one other factor. What what would happen in the past is people would build this plane, and I've done this with Cardinals. I've made an uh, unequal panel by an inch, by three quarters of an inch, by two inches. I liked it best when it was equal or minimum, the minimum amount of offset. Another problem when you make a plane with with unequal plane, one flap has to be bigger, has to have more taper, There's oh, they have trim tabs out here, all kind of things that I really don't I really don't like. The argument is always, and it always has been, that if you build this type of plane, that the overall plane will be lighter. And the one factor they net that people never seem to take into account is that you have to the, the extra piece of the wing that you're adding weighs something, and that would be a significant amount. I don't know how much, but it, it's certainly some. But it also forces you to reinforce or make the wing stronger in the middle, because in, in essence you have more span. So obviously you have to strengthen the middle of the wing some when you have an unequal panel plane. So it's the same as a four-stroke argument where people say, ah, oh, four strokes an ounce heavier, two ounces heavier, three ounces. But they don't take into account the nose is shorter and you don't have two ounces of nose. So sometimes a good argument, if you leave out one of the arguments in the argument, you miss the whole point. Now, the reason I'm saying this now is, and I, and I want to go to the next level, if, this is my feeling. An equal panel plane, of which the B-25 and many of our designs, equal panel, I like that it'll carry the tip weight. I don't want to pay for an extra ounce of weight or half ounce or third of an ounce or anything that's going to make the middle of the wing weaker. It's going to cause more span loading. A lot of other things. I don't like the way it looks. One of the things, a B-25 with a big inboard wing, eh, I don't know. And I certainly don't like all these little unequalnesses in flaps and whatever. So this is the reason we chose to make the plane equal panel. We're looking for a solid line tension plane where all of the weight is doing work, not going along for, for some kind of an asymmetrical ride. Now I'm going to spend a lot of time, I mean a really lot of time today, getting this this wing and maybe this part of the wing 
and maybe just a little bit in here, as light as possible. The reason is, in the overall weight of the plane, the total weight of the plane, if I add an ounce out here, I've really added two ounces to the plane, just to make easy numbers, because I need an ounce out here to counteract that ounce, the same way as I would need an ounce in the nose, I need an ounce in the tail. So every bit of weight that I can remove from here, I'm removing double the amount of weight of the plane overall. So if I get out an ounce here, it means the ultimate plane is going to be two ounces lighter. So I will really spend the time today with those hollowing tools and gouges and whatever, trying to get this as light as possible. A very, very significant thing if you understand how the, this works the same way with a nose and tail. You don't want to have a heavy tail because you need an ounce, if you put an ounce of weight in the tail, you need 1.8 typically in the nose. You, and you, you double that amount of weight. It triples actually. When you make a heavy tail, you add an ounce to the tail, you're adding three ounces to the model. So understanding that the plane is always going to need tip weight and, and it, unless you have some kind of new cosmetic flying style that I don't know about. Most planes need some amount, an ounce upward of tip weight. Any weight you can get off of here is going to, in essence, make this ounce more effective. So you're doubling your money. It's like doubling your money. This is an important concept and it's why, and you may not really see it on the video because I try not to let these carving and sanding scenes get too long, but it's super important to do that. It's also important in terms of finish. When I go to finish the plane, I'm going to really be cheesy out here. And, be, and on the bottom, this will really be cheesy. But out here, I can spray away. Get the gun, put 8, 10, 15 coats. Then what happens, somebody comes up to the model, because this is always the outside of the circle, and they look and they rub their hand. Wow, nice finish. They never even notice that this wing has a lot less paint. Or just one final quick thought because it relates to tips. Years ago, I remember, <coughs> better not mention his name, somebody showed up at the field with a tip weight box right here. A nice big tip weight box. You could put a, a pack of cigarettes in with two screws holding it. I said, well, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Well, what's wrong is if you put tip weight here, let's, let's do this, and, and let's say that this, whatever this dimension is, X, and I put my tip weight box out here, what happens is I need less weight to do the same job. So there's always some little angles, and my angle has always been in these cases is to get the tip weight box, and I think we've done that as far forward, because planes typically don't come out nose heavy as often, and this one sure isn't, as often as they come out tail heavy. So having the weight forward and as far out in the tip instead of further back, that can save you time too. Just a couple of things relating to tips, because that's the part of the job. And I try to all through the course of the videos, get as when, it, when a thought goes through my mind, something that people might be able to use, I like to include it on the video. All right, back to the shop, back to hollowing and carving. This will be fun. Yeah, this morning before breakfast, I got down here and just took the gouge and tried to see how much weight I could get out of this tip. But now I'm going to take a lot of time and get an oil. I want to get this really hollowed out. This is one, and like I just said on a drawing, one of the things I will get in there with the gouge and the sandpaper and try to get in the corner here even to the point of making it a little on a flimsy side, because if it gets a little flimsy, I can glass it, but I really don't want to be carrying an extra half ounce, a quarter of an ounce. I don't want to be carrying even one gram extra on that inner tip. I have to gouge them all this out. So what I constantly do is just feel it with my finger for the thickness. I really want this to be Again, this is probably like the tail, one of the areas in the model where it really pays to spend an extra little bit of time. Because this is an unusual tip shape, I really, uh, I wanted to think this through in every way, not just, not just do something that I could figure a better way of doing it. This piece of thin plywood, I think, is going to reinforce this a little bit. I'll, when I'm done sanding this, I'll hit some extra thin CA on this.
I really got as far in there as I could with the gouge. And I want to constantly hold this up to the light here because we are getting pretty thin in spots. But any time I spend here now, I'm doubling my money. Every time I take a gram off, I'm really taking two grams off of the total weight of the model. Now I'll take my time and just get this as smooth, constantly feel it until the whole thing is nice and smooth. And when I hold it up to the light, it'll look relatively uh, the same color as the light shines through. Just a question of spending a little time. Nice, <clears throat> nice little tip. These, we affectionately call these Bud McKnight standing, sanding sticks since he was the one that introduced us to the original idea of using nail files. This was years ago. You can buy these in any beauty supply place, relatively inexpensive too, a nice benefit, but I cut them to all different angles. Here's an example of where they, they come in real handy, because you can't really get your finger in there and get out that last little bit of wood. And believe me, I will spend the time and get this any little bit I can get out of here. You can work your way right in there. It's very handy. A lot of times, uh, like in a wheel pant or in a wing tip or up in a canopy area, being able to get that last little bit out. I tack glued this together. You can see I need to add a little chunk up there. And now I need to also relieve the foam. Just put a little gouge in the foam so that these won't start tearing up the foam. I need to do a little work on the end of the wing. I'll take these off and then rub this perfectly flat. Get a perfectly flat surface here. The next step. I want to fill in this little gouge here. Once that kicks off, we'll just trim and sand that right off. I just want to get as much of the rough sanding as because once I get this part in, then I need to work down to that last 64th or so of an inch and get everything blended in. Now what I did, I did a little test fit, had a cut out some of the foam here, of course, because I want to have more adjustment for the leadouts. Thin this out to about an eighth of an inch. Check that my little nylon blocks are moving front to back. Now what I'm going to do is mix up some 500 epoxy. Get the perimeter of this. And I want to be real careful that none drips down onto this side. So what I'm going to do is when I, when I let it dry, I'll lay it in this position so everything will tend to run away from these blocks. And I'll put that aside to dry. I have some other projects to work on. Get that done today, and I'll get that final sanded out, and I will really feel it. We'll be ready to start silk spanning the wing. That'll really be a major step forward. Okay, we'll let that set. I don't want to take the tape with until I know that epoxy's good and solid. The next step, now that the epoxy is dry, is to get all of these edges, and I'm thinking, I'm just thinking of something here because I already broke it with my finger taking the tape off. I'll put a little plywood piece on the edge here, 64th plywood, but getting all these edges sanded out, and this again is time consuming because we've made everything about a 64th of an inch bigger than it has to be because we had the tape on there. So now getting the blend, and we'll spend a little time on this because I want this to really be right. And there's a little chunk that we had to fill in in the front here. Any little spot I can make a little cork for, but I can see this is, see, as I'm doing work like this, I can see, uh oh, that's vulnerable. You'd be wiping a plane off and whatever. So we're just going to put a 64th piece of plywood in there. 
it's a cheap price to pay because what happens after the plane is all painted and inked and clear, and then you put a dent in it, oh, that now you've made a repair that's that's a, an all-day job. To where I've dinged it with my finger, so. But I think this is going to work fine. This this looks like just what I had envisioned, and I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's a little overkill. I don't know, but one of the things that I know that area there is going to be vulnerable. Now, when you know an area is going to be vulnerable, see, I've already hardened up the edge here with CA, hardened this edge up. When you're not, you may as well do it right now and bury it in the paint, because when you, after the plane is all painted and then you ding it, again, that is such a pain, you're, and you really want to tear your hair out. I heard today from Kent Teister, by the way, talking about these kind of things, and he's basically abandoning the model he's working on now. He had put that that black uh, carbon veil on the plane and had terrible luck with it. He was real unhappy. In fact, it's so bad that he's abandoning the plane. So, buyer beware. If you use that material, be careful. That, that can be a problem to use if you're not familiar with, uh, I guess, the tricks. And I don't know who's published the tricks yet because I'm not familiar using it either. I have a piece of 64th play. Again, I want to harden up this edge to sand it out reasonably nice. Now I know I want to make this about an eighth of an inch thick, so well, again, one of the things that's a good trick is the tape that allow us to keep it relatively consistent. Oh yeah, we're getting coming up on a time. Maybe we get some, even get some coats of dope on this today. Just sand it out really nice. Now, because I know I want an eighth of an inch sticking down, and I'll add just a a tiny bit of sixty fourth extra. The blue tape will let me keep this consistent when I line it up. Now I basically can. Let's do this. And what this allows me to do now, using this for a guide, I can slide this down an eighth of an inch and just lightly glue it in place. Again, I've got to be real careful not to glue those little nylon blocks in place. Now let that that's glued in place. This gives me a good alignment here. As soon as that kicks off, then I can just slice this right off. And that'll give me, I hope, a nice edge to work off. A small detail to be sure, but I think that'll pay dividends in the long run. We won't be hooking it with our fingernails and wiping a plane off. Now, another thing, while this is drying, I want to mention something. I always try to put the ends on the leadouts as soon as possible. There's a reason. Because if these slip into the wing, and a lot of people, they wait till they paint the plane to, to wrap them or to crimp them. Well, if that slips into the wing, you're making a hatch, baby. There's... The sooner we can get these crimped, I just feel like that's cheap insurance and we'll be doing that as soon as we get this trimmed off. But that's a good way to get yourself a nice, this type of thing where you want a, a very even amount. And I want to make sure I'm not binding up on anything because I did cut a lot of foam away there. And I'll do the final sanding of this part. We're ready to put some clear dope on this. Feels like it's hitting some foam. Oh, there we go. Now, even though this doesn't have to be like a, a control system, but I really, I want to want it as smooth as possible so I don't slip with the wrench and break something. Now, as soon as I sand this out, wrap the lead outs, we'll be ready to put some clear on a wing. Now, as I said before, the sooner you get the leadouts wrapped, the less chance or you eliminate the possibility they're going to go back into the wing. Now, in the past, people have done this, and been because we're selling a lot of bell cranks with cable leadouts, they make the leadout that it goes right up against the wing. But now, if they ever want to rewrap it, wow, they're lost. So I like to leave what I call an insurance. In other words, I'll let this one be out here. I want to have insurance here in case I need to rewrap this that I don't have to cut the wing apart to do it. I always want to have insurance. 
And it sounds like that would be a small point, but you'd be surprised how many people have to cut cut a patch in a wing and then put a splice in it, whatever. So anyway, I want to measure as far out as these are going to go. Now, I've used the crimps. All modern airplanes use crimps. Nobody wraps wire, but, but wrapping with copper wire is fine too. But if you use crimps, you've got to have a proper crimping tool. What I wanted to do is show on a macro lens. The crimp is a little, looks like an eight. And each one is made for a specific diameter wire. Now these are specifically made for that wire, the same company that makes the wire makes the crimps. And you also need the crimping tool to match these crimps. So it's a match set. Now if somebody were not to want to purchase a crimping tool, and if they pay me the postage, I'll loan them my crimping tool, but it's you can also squeeze these in a vise. But, but I think it's best. It's, it's just the easiest of all worlds to crimp these. Now, a couple of tips. These are the big eyelets. These are not the small ones you get. The small one will put too much of a kink in a wire. You don't, you don't ever want to even think in your wildest dream about soldering them. Wrap it, soft wrap, or crimp it, but don't, don't even think about solder. Solder detempers the wire, makes it brittle as glass. The point is I've left myself enough that if I really ever damage this, putting it in and out of the car, I can just re-crimp. I still have enough room. And of course I'd like to get neutral and then get them even. <coughs> and notice I didn't bring this all the way up here because I don't want to put a stress riser right in the end of the wire. I want just a little bit of a gap. And because these are aircraft quality, they're not it's not a good idea to even think about putting a piece of copper tube here or filling it with epoxy or some of the other things I've seen people do that have, that have failed in service. This is the best way to do it. Best way I know of. Now there's another little thing that I do is when you trim the wire here, of course, it's like a razor blade. So I really want to get in there and just touch that with a file without touching that wire. So the easy way to do this and these are the little things that can make you crazy. There's always a little razor edge there. And believe me, if there's a razor edge, my fingers will find it. What I do is I just do this and then get a little file. This protects me from hitting this part of the wire. Small little detail things, but having these relatively smooth, where they're not catching on a paper towel every time you wipe the plane off or catching on your nose or something. Okay, we got the whole wing sanded out. Now, I mean, this is a point at which I really do spend a little extra time. Getting everything block sanded out, getting as many of the little dings out of it as I can. And we're ready for some clear dope. Now, there's a lot of good little tricks I can pass on to you. One of the things, when you have a foam wing, you can't take the first coat of dope and put it on with 70% thinner, or you run the risk that some of it will go down and melt the foam. So I want to be real careful the first, and if you if you put it on with no thinner, what happens when you pull up the tape? It's going to pull the paint up. But the good compromise with Brodac dope, and I've done this many times, is, a, it's an excellent, is mix a batch exactly 50-50. No substitute on thinner, no retarder. And the first thing, I'll take some and just real quickly put a brush over all the edges. In the corners here where it tends to get thin because we've tapered this all down. But anywhere there's an edge, get it on just the slightest coat so that now you've got a coat on here. When you go to put the wet coat on, you don't run the risk that someone's going to get down into the glue seam. And this will only happen in an extreme case, an extreme case being somebody puts way too much thinner in. But a good compromise is 50-50. So the first thing I'll do is get a batch, make it up 50-50, and get one coat on all of the seams. And then from that point, once it's dry, give the whole wing three or four coats. And then the most important step of all, I'm going to come back and block sand the whole wing out because that dope is going to expand the wood grain. 
And when I go back to sand it, I'll be able to pick up all the high spots. Now, as I always do, I'll do the bottom first. I made an exact batch, a pint of clear, a pint of thinner. And it's on a re it's relatively on the thick side. But I want to get all of these, these areas, like I said, that, that could be a problem. And from this point on, once you get one or two or three coats on, it'll be very easy. We'll just add a little thinner to the mix. But a foam wing, you always have to take into, the, into account that possibility that, especially when you're using the, the, uh, the contact cement method. Again, the reason for doing the bottom is if there is going to be a problem, if I melt a little foam or something on the bottom, well, I could always make a, a little patch a little bit easier. So what I'll do is I'll do the bottom first, give it 15, 20 minutes to dry. Now that's one vulnerable area. Even though we have glass on this, this will be another area where it may be a problem. All along the leading edge. So in essence, what this will have is an extra coat of dough. You really, on a foam wing, you don't want to have the same amount of dope on the whole wing, like a, like a monocoat job. In the areas that are vulnerable, leading and trailing edges, you want to have a lot extra. On the seams, you want a lot extra. And in the middle, you don't need that much. Now, uh, the reason, again, that I'm kind of putting the push on this instead of working on other projects is I can get, if I can get either today or tomorrow, get the tissue on this, then I can put this aside to dry for a couple days, work on some of the other things, and then when I come back to it, the dope will sand out like butter. It'll just be a piece of cake. So I'm always thinking of the scheduling of the job. Boy, I hated to hear that with Kent Tyser. We spoke on the phone, and he was... He was a little annoyed. He had put that the mat on, and I guess he he didn't do it. Well, I'm not sure I know how to do it, but he was annoyed. So we need to get somebody out there that's had good luck with that to write it up for stunt news or give us a heads up on it. Anyway, I'll get the rest of this dope on off camera, but we'll be back with this probably later tonight or tomorrow to do the tissue, but I don't like to rush this. I like to let plenty of time dry between coats. And while this is drying, we do have other projects to work on. As I was doing the tip weight box and not paying attention, I got some dope down into the foam. You know, I did, just, just keep in mind, and if you have this kind of a thing where it's exposed to the foam, it might be a good idea. Maybe after this dries, I'll put some tape or something in here to remind me not to get any down there. You really don't want to have that foam melting away from the wing. You, you have the chance of getting a ripple. Anyway, it is ready to dry up. Just one little thing I thought of late in the, uh, <laughs> as we're putting dope on the wing. And we're building up on these coats of dope, but I'm getting each one dry outside. Give it plenty of time to dry, we're not in any rush. I got another little project to work on here that fill in some of the time while we're waiting for dope to dry, and that's always a good idea not to rush it. Of course, the areas that are that have the fiberglassing, see, there, they stay shiny, well, this gets dry a lot quicker. So what I'll want to do, again, is put on the raw wood at least one or two extra coats, where on the fiberglass you really only need maybe, maybe two or three. I want plenty plenty on there because the next step on this is going to be I'm going to block sand all this sh all these sheeted surfaces out and now that we have the tips and everything in one piece you can kind of stand back and get a little more look of how that I think that wing looks I think it's unfair to even call this semi scale it's more like very scale anyway I think Dave Downey's going to be real impressed when he sees this in, in real life
Anyway, we're going to divert a little bit here. We're going to take a little break from working on a B-25. Boy, I'm watching wings today. They, they got more good stuff on the wings. Look at these props. Counter-rotating. I love this stuff. Now, yeah, I want to back this up just a little bit. The original Strega, and of course we still have them sitting right here in the shop as our, one of our test planes. But And he's been one of the best ever. A lot of people think that's the best plane I've ever flown. Well, some people do, some people don't. I kind of, I'm not, I'm not partial. Anyway, there is now a 40 size version of that plane that's become very, very popular. And Elliot Scott has done a great job with the plans. Several have been built already. And I've already made a commitment myself to get one by the springtime. Now, rather than build it myself, since I'm going to use it to test motors and we're going to use it to test a little Jet 35 in and some of the other things, I, uh, I'm having Walter Emlin build me a little Strega. Now, this is only part, I, d I don't want to take time away from my B-25 project to build it. And this is what Walter's in business for. And he does such a good job. He's done such a good job for many of the people that I know, like Bob Lampione, Jimmy Borelli, just for a few. But I, I really feel like he's going to add something to our program. Because we need to have these motors for the B-25. Now, by having a test plane, and we'll have that probably in a couple of months, one of the things I wanted to do, as long as we're going to do this, and Elliot Scott has built up a little Strega, some of the guys in England are already building one, I told them to make a cowl mold, and I'll start making cowls for these. Now, it's just so convenient when somebody takes the time to make a part, and then when you come along, you want to copy that part, and you just, it's done in 30 minutes. And this cowl mold, this plug, I'm going to make the mold right now was done by Elliot Scott in England. Now we've done this many times on video. This, this came from England today, from Elliot Scott. And this is the little 40 Strega cow mold. Now, by doing a nice job on it and getting all the edges nice, what he's going to allow us to do is anybody that buys a set of plans for this, they can buy a cowling. And they, they don't have to carve this and figure out all the angles and everything. Th this will be a done deal. First and second of all, it'll never absorb fuel. It'll be durable. And if you ever even crash the plane, you can get another one that'll be exactly the same. The trick with any of these composite cowls is when you have the cowl in your hand, you want to make the cowl first and then match the fuselage to the cowl. You don't want to make a plane and then try to make the cowl fit the plane. That's, that's like reverse technology. Now this looks like it has a pretty nice finish on it, so what I'm going to do is using molding rubber, smooth on molding rubber, I'm going to make a box around here, mix some molding rubber, and today, while I'm waiting for my dope to dry, make the, the rubber female mold for a little 40 size Strega. And by the way, anybody wants one of these, we'll have them in stock, along with, we're up to about 30 that we have. Just as a side note, Jimmy Schneider is aggressively working on our wax plug. We decided to go with wax, even though he doesn't have it finished yet. I was going to wait till we had both of them, but I'd like to get this moving along. We have several people building these little Stragas, and we can get them. We can get them a cow, including Walter, by the way. Anyway, we're going to do the same, pretty much same, similar technology on our cow for the B25. And how handy will that be? Because the other people, if anybody wants to build a B-25, we can supply them with cowls. That's number one. We also have another motive here, is we're going to try to make this, and I think Elliot's already got some sketches, we're going to try to make a plane. You could, first off, you can put a radial engine on a profile just to dress it up, kind of make it a little more interesting. But we could also make a plane similar to a Cardinal that had a 30s look, radial cowl, because we'll already have the mold, and maybe an open cockpit, so we got a lot of choices. Let me get busy making these up. We're going to be we're going to be doing cowls in the next couple of weeks. Anyway, this is the molding rubber that we use for this. To do a cowl mold, you need about a pound. This is a ten-pound mix. It's ten to one ratio. There's a couple very simple tricks to using this. Number one is, and before you even think about using this, because before I even make the box, I want to take the lid off and stir this for about five minutes. 
The reason for doing it ahead of time is it lets all the air bubbles sink to the bottom of the can. Number one, when you're doing molding rubber, the first trick, you buy some of this from Smooth On, you can buy a pound, keep the lid on tight. That's number one. Number two, you'll see I already have a stick I leave in a can. It gets marbleized when it sits for a long time. This has sat for a while. So what I want to do is I want to stir it like I'm stirring molasses, very slow, maybe four or five minutes, a couple of minutes anyway. And then I want to let this sit. And while this is sitting, what will happen? All the air will rise to the top. And while it's doing that, we'll make the box for the mold, the base of the mold. Again, this material is always nice if it's room temperature. I have the shop cold today, so you can see just how, how really cold this is. It's really glocky. Glocky is a nice word. Sounds like a Polish word. Point on, I just cut up four pieces of scrap wood. Each one will be a little bit bigger. And I'll make the box with extended legs. Again, nothing really special. This this will all get thrown away in the end. Get me some Brodac. Good old fashioned Brodac glue here. Anyway, this little Strega has become so popular. I'm not I'm thinking we may be making some other parts for it soon too. See now I can lay this right down on the table. Once this kicks off. The glass at the bottom will hold it, then I can use duct tape to keep it keep it even free. To do is have one end, I don't even finish off that end. All of the parts have one 90 degree finished end, because now when I go to this part, you can just put this one right in front of this one. Let the little piece hang off. It's as simple as pie to make a little box. Just pinch these ends together and go on each side can have an outstanding leg. A completed box. I have sealed up all the seams with CA. I actually could put some duct tape on the bottom if I wanted to, but now I have a box that I can pour the molding rubber in. So the next step is to mix up the rubber. It's a 10 to 1 ratio. I have to do it with a gram scale. Step one is to weigh the cup. And we need to write these numbers down because we're old and our memory is failing. So we're going to allow 11 for the cup. Now I need to fill almost about three quarters of this with molding rubber because I need to leave room 10% by weight, PBW, by weight. This is the trick. See how all the air has risen to the top since we've let that sit while we were making the box? That's one of the better tricks because any air bubble is going to show up in the final mold. So all I need to do now is very carefully, and I'll do it right over the cup, fill this up three quarters, get the weight of the cup, then take 10% of the weight, deduct off the total of weight of the cup, 10% of, of the hardener, and then mix it, and when you think it's mixed, mix it two, three, four, even five minutes more because this has a shelf life of over an hour. Good thing is to wear rubber gloves. This stuff is really sticky and gooey. And even though I don't think this is ultra, you know, uh, critical to the mix ratio, you really don't want to have. One of the mistakes you can make is try to pour this. When you're done, it just, oh my God, it's everywhere. I do about three quarters of a cup and then see how much you never want to mix more of this than you need because what happens, it'll just go bad. You have one, The idea of doing two moles at once, if we had the, the cowl plug for the B25, would be we could use whatever was left over in the second mold, or in that case, if I have the plug left over, I can make a second mold. So I could make two of these a day. Look at this. The phone has to ring. Oh. It's yapping on the phone. I let this sit. You can see that the bubbles rise to the surface. We have our little box. Now what we're going to try to do is, very carefully now, it's all mixed and homogenized and kind of stuff you can do while you're on the phone. You know, I just want to show this. This is one of the tricks, is get it in all the corners first. Don't just pour it in the middle. You don't want to trap air. You would like to get, in the best of all worlds, 
get none or very few air bubbles right up on the part. So in essence, we want to paint the part and just let it sit. Another thing, if, you, if we just about run out of rubber and we come right up on the end and don't have any more rubber, well, that'll be real easy. We'll just jam some pieces along the edge. You see, we've already got some air bubbles trapped in there. And if we were to just take this and dump it, we, those air bubbles would never get to the top. They just would linger down there by the plug, and we don't want that. Now what I want to do is let this go, and I'll do this off camera, back and forth, back and forth, to try to get as much of the air out as possible. And then when I'm all done, I'll put another layer, another layer, another layer, because I'm trying to get that the air is constant, the bubbles are constantly coming to the top. After a minute or two, you can see the bubbles bubbling up. Now we don't care if they're up here at the top of the mold. I don't want them down on the plug, though. And the best thing is just be patient. With it more coming up here, it just takes time. And we go to the next little level of pour. And I'll do this four or five times. Just do this one more time here. Let that aerate. A lot of times when it's real cold like this in the shop, I'll just use a little bit of heat on a low setting. And then this has to cure at room temperature for 24 hours. You can see as we cover it up, now what I'm going to do, because we're not really thick enough on the high part, I'm going to shove a little piece of wood front and back, or maybe put some in the corner, just to raise the level of this up just a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm paper thin right there at the high point. And as this sits, it'll take about an hour. Hopefully all the air will rise to the surface. And while we're, then we'll put that aside to dry 24 hours and come back to it. pieces, the only purpose they serve is to raise the level of rubber in the mold. And again, a mold like this is roughly $30 worth of material. Maybe $35 now. I think they just raised the price of this. You need about a pound of molding rubber to do that. But forever and ever and ever you have, and not only for you, it's for all your friends too. Or, you know, I can sit here for about the next 10-15 minutes and just pop the air bubble so this is just so we have a little bit better product here in the mold. Because we may be making hundreds of parts from this mold. Again, we, do, we just don't know. We never know. And you never know, like this mold may fit. There's a little tsunami coming out soon. A 40 size tsunami. This may fit that plane too. Little Spitfires, little something. And this is the kind of little modeling project pretty much anybody can do. By the way, the address if you want to buy some of this. Let's get the phone number on here. 610-252-5800. They are good people. They're in Pennsylvania. They have a good tech hotline. And their material works well. It's worked well for me over the last four or five years. Not tonight. Well, the dope isn't dry yet. So I'm going to work on Ron Merrill's crutches. And I want to, the first thing, say... This is the technology that uh, years ago Big Jim Greenaway taught me. It has worked flawlessly on any plane I've ever put it on. And we're going to extend that now to include Ron's 191. I call it a bulletproof crutch. It's really a Big Jim Greenaway crutch. Years ago we used to all have uh, just painful motor runs vibration problems, whatnot, cracks in the nose. And when Jim came up with this idea for this crutch, it basically eliminated the problem forever. It's an excellent way to build. I'm gonna go through this real quickly. And you can apply this technology, this, this system to any plane. We're gonna use a variation of it on the B-25 when we make the B-25 nacelles, but right now, give Jim the credit he's due. This, this has worked out well and been what is this? What is this? Who are you? You know, if Big Jim was here, he'd eat you. Now step, step one, we use, and these are hardened aluminum, 
anodized motor mount pads. Jimmy Snyder machines these, George. Ben Torini Jr. anodizes them, so we always have these to mount the motor to, unless you're using a carbon fiber crutch. This is, if you're going to use a wood crutch, this is my first choice for mounting the motor. Now, because we have a good choice of match sets of motor mounts here, both 3 8 and half inch, we always want to look for a set that's nice and straight. And at the grain, is similar in both parts this way if they are going to twist they're not going to twist in different directions all the motor mounts I sell are match sets you see how that's cut from the same piece of wood and because this is a match set I'm just making a little reference line of my own here and because I have to make two of them I want to make one that I can identify which is which it's not funny, years ago we used to have these motor run problems, boy, in the early 80s. You, the noses used to crack and everything, and when Jim came up with that system, we've used that well. Okay, so now we'll, because we're going to make two of these, I'll take one set apart at a time. And keep in mind, any plane, you can adapt this, this system to any plane, Nobler, any Brodex kits, Randy Smith's plane, doesn't matter, anything, Cardinal. I lay out on the motor mount side, roughly, just roughly where the bolts are going to go. And of course the reason I need to know that is because I don't want to have it, I don't want to have that, I want to have it and leave an eighth of an inch for nose ring clearance. This this 100, by the way, is going to go in a, a giant hyperbipe, a giant biplane. So the first step is I have these just tack glued with CA down to the mounts, allowing myself an eighth of an inch roughly for clearance so we can put a nose ring on the plane. Now because the 100 and the 91, the holes are definitely unique. They're not interchangeable. And the motor length is a little different. The bigger motor, of course, is a little longer. So I need to, from this point on, now that I have these all glued together, is leave the 91 set with the 91. Of course, if you're only making one, you don't have to deal with this. Now these little number two screws, hold it in place, even though it's glued in with CA. The reason for the CA, it keeps fuel from seeping under there. And once you have this bolted together, you can't really keep drops of oil or anything, prime or whatever from under there, but the CA seems to seal it up real well. No needless to say, I like to have a pilot hole, a little tiny pilot hole when I put these in. Again, every step of this is, if you do the sequencing on it, you find out it goes very quickly. If you skip steps or miss steps, it can be uh, like it, it gets harder to do. But from this point on, I can, I can segregate these by which motor is which. Now a handy thing is I take a a ballpoint pen apart so I can get down in there easier and of course I've already got the motor the mount right up to the motor and what that does I've got some center points now for drilling these out and before I drill the holes all the way through I always just put a little spot on there so I can see that I'm perfectly lined up because once I drill the holes, if they're wrong, I've thrown away a $10 set of pads and a, and a $10 set of mounts. I've thrown $20 away if these holes don't line up. So there's a little spot. Now, even if I was wrong, I could adjust this very slightly. And once those holes are drilled, then I double check again to make sure I've got... Because if they're, if they're cocked or anything, I need to start all over again. Because the motor acts as, as a fixture while the epoxy's dry in here, so we really can't just improvise. In other words, if these holes are off in one way, once I tighten the bolts, the crutch is not gonna, it's not gonna have any integrity. Now I can get rid of the tape, and just put the blind nuts in place. Now I'll usually hit these with a countersink just to make it a little more uh, workmanlike. A little countersink just makes it a little bit nicer, I think, more like a machine shop job would be. 
Now the blind nuts are secured in. Now this is this is where it gets a little tricky. I make this hand tight, and I can set up a ruler, a machinist ruler, or anything. In this case, I want to check the whole length. You can see the little dot I just put. You don't even just make sure I'm true for the whole length of the port. Once I am, now I want to put the wood in cross grain, and this, of course half inch balsa, half inch mounts, I need to precision cut this. Now the only way I know that I can get a really nice cut on this, that it'll be a pretty accurate fit every time, is with a blade and not with a pen. What happens when I have a pen, and let me do this the other way around so you can get a better view. I try to get one edge of this just caught by the slightest amount. Whoops. Like I said, I'll cut my finger off here just to entertain you. Okay, there we go. Now this is the mark. And what I'll do is I'll cut with the saw blade on this side of the mark. And then just little by little, just touch that with a piece of sandpaper until I can get a press fit into the crutch. I want that to be cross grain is the most important thing and a press fit. What I'm looking for is a press fit that it can press it in and it'll stay in there without any glue. Now I need to make three of these up. Okay, now I need, if any of these are way too tight, I can sand them. What I want to do is make sure, that even when these are in compression, that I'm still perfectly straight. Now I need to mix up some slow drying epoxy. Get the kind of epoxy that takes overnight to dry. Because we're dealing with end grain, it's it's important. You could do this with CA, I guess, but I like having the epoxy because then I put it in a vise and let it sit there overnight. Now because it's end grain, I want to get plenty on here. We don't care if this is a little bit drippy and drooly, but we want it plenty of glow. Let it soak in for a couple minutes before we actually put it together. Now, I don't want to block off the carburetor area. Now, you can see as I'm tightening the clamp, I'm squeezing out the epoxy. Back here, I just put the tape in to hold it in place. Now this pretty much has to sit in a, in a fixture overnight. You can also put a clamp back here. And it'll sit under compression until tomorrow when we pull it apart. And we'll make the other one off camera. It's pretty much going to be the same thing. But the motor is actually acting as a fixture to hold everything in place while that slow drying epoxy dries. A good way to make a crutch. Well, I gave him a nice quick sanding. Now keep in mind from this point, if you're going to use a four stroke, for sure, and these are. One of the choices you have is once you know the tank height, or roughly what the tank height is, and the center would line up with the needle valve, of course, you really should glue the shim in place at that point in time. It would just make the nose even more rigid. Anyway. Is he going off to Ron Merrill? I hope he'll have good luck and he'll be sending us some pictures of that bipe. The giant Steve Busso bipe. What a great project. Now on the wing, we had three coats dry overnight. And what's happened is, when we sanded the wood flat, relatively flat anyway, once you soak it with the dope and it dries out, the wood then becomes, and I'm not going to belabor this, but you need to just block sand down these high spots and edges. Also, wherever we have a joint, and there's usually a little bit of a high spot at the joint, or do I want to taper this in. So I don't want to, when I run my hand over it, I don't want to feel any rough spots. And I, this is a very time consuming part of it before I tissue it. But I'll take the time now. I want to get this and I'll do it all with a block get any high spots that have come up from the wood, especially this real light soft wood that we're using, tends to really, as soon as you wet it, it changes. 
Then we're going to put on one more coat of clear dope, just to make sure we haven't, because any of the spots we've sanded through, I don't want to have a dry spot or a spot where I'm going to get a bubble, and that, that can happen. I'll put one more really wet coat on, but by now, I'm kind of safe that none of the thinner is going to get down into the, sh and down into the foam, and then we're ready to tissue it. And then there's going to be a lot of spots where we double tissue over it, specifically over the joints, try to get all double tissue. Then we can block sand this all in. And I'm hoping, uh, my real hope is here, that we can really get that. See, one of the reasons I wanted a foam wing is so it, it would be very realistic. It wouldn't look like open bays, like a nobler, you know, a B25 with nobler open bays. But again, I, I want to have that look of an aluminum wing where there's no ripples and no, exactly the opposite of a rib wing, where you're looking for all those light reflecting things. This I'd like to get as flat as possible. This is, the, this is a part, like, people ask you on a phone, like, as if there was a magic thing, three coats, one coat, two coats. There's, in my case, and you probably have watched how I, I lay the material on, I would say three to five coats. But this might, this might not be three to five coats. If you tend to put on dope a little bit thinner, maybe it's more, but there's a way of telling. And the way you tell is when you have, when you're all ready to put the tissue on, that wing should have just a slight gloss, just the slightest hint of a gloss. Now you've seen Rich and some of the other people in the last couple of weeks or months or so that have bubbles in a plane. Bubbles usually are a spot in the wood where the tissue isn't sticking down. And what happens when you wet it? This expands and you wind up with a bubble because there's no bond right here. And that's what's happening. And then you have to take that number 11 blade and fill it full of little pinholes and CA, and it's a real nuisance to do that. A lot better, pay me now or pay me later. Now, one thing you shouldn't be afraid of is, is if you have a little bit too much underneath. Because let's say here's the wood and you had, we'll make this a little bit, let's say you really, you put seven coats underneath. Nothing bad would happen because when you put the tissue on this, and wet it, the tissue is going to float down and all this dope's going to rise up through the tissue anyway. You're not going to have, in other words, there's a lot more of a chance of making a mistake if you cheat a coat here than if you put one on. Now if you do put more on, what's going to happen? You're going to sand it off anyway when you block sand it. So there's really almost no risk in putting an extra coat or two underneath the tissue. That's, that's not where you build up weight. It's not been my experience that this is something you really have to worry about. But if it's dry and you see little bubbles in places or pull up the tape, talk about it could ruin your whole day. So what I try to do is use like 320 or 400. And I'm trying not to sand through into the wood, but just to knock down and, and I can feel these edges with my hand. Because the, especially around the seams, if you can knock a little bit of this off now. Again, this is not like a major sand. I don't want to see wood. But anything I can get smoothed out now, so I can't feel the seam, or around the leading edge here. Again, if you detail out the part right now, it just gives you a little bit of a, a head start on that thing over here where we have the big seams. This is where the seams, see how shiny that is from the fiberglass? Because the dope doesn't sit in the fiberglass. Now you can feel that seam, but I don't want to, because it's a mountaintop, I don't want to cut it smooth. So I'll just very lightly go over that and then work my way up on one side, work my way up on the other side, but not do this. You don't want to make that seam real thin. I don't want to cut through that. And then when this is done, I'll need to get one more coat of dope on this, get it outside drying. You, the best thing always is to, and you, you see how it powders, or once you see it powdering off, you know you're home for real. Do everything with your hand. You can watch TV while you're doing it, go, go watch Wings or something because your hands will find a spot a lot quicker than your eye when it's in wood. Wood grain tends to hide little flaws. 
That's why we use the silver later on. But right here, I can feel I'm doing it with my hand now. Right here, there's a little spot. And the more it is you get out now, it allows the tissue to sit down nice and flat. Now this is another thing that's a great tip is every time I sand this or every time I put dope on it I want to just kiss that corner all of the edges on the wing also leading trailing edges hinge pockets well we don't have hinge pockets yet but all of these edges the reason is you want to start building up that nice radius now when you don't do that then you see I think which was the last one I saw that had where you start to see the tissue coming up at the corners eventually or then when you sand through you hit raw wood this way you're building that radius in every step of the way every time you work on this we should get that radius just just touched I'm ready to cut up the tissue here and I was I was just trying to measure it out if I try to do this in one piece right around the joint I'm going to create a stress riser the tissue is going to want to pull in different directions so what I thought I'd do is I'm just going to overlap these joints maybe by about two inches something like that that would be a problem trying to cover that I can anticipate that that probably would be a problem anyway I'm going to cut up all the pieces ahead of time and we're ready to start doping and tissue in this wing up it's time before I start the tissue in I have to make sure I don't have any dust on it. Cleaned up the table, put a clean sheet down. Oh, clean by my standards anyway. To sand it out kind of nice, and I, I really don't want to have anything underneath the tissue, a little a dead bug or something. Anything I can do to make this nicer now. I have the tissue all cut ahead of time. Just use the a little bit of Windex to wet the tissue down. Damp, not wet. The reason is the Windex evaporates a lot quicker. It doesn't penetrate, especially on a foam wing, it doesn't penetrate into the wood and swell the wood up. And that's what we're looking to try to avoid. Now this mix is a little, I put a little more thinner in it. This is about 60% thinner. All Brodac products, Brodac thinner. Again, coming up with where I want to point the joints here is just a little bit. I'll, and I'll only do one panel here. The bird has been eating that mold that we made yesterday. I hope he didn't destroy Elliot's part here. Now fortunately, uh, or unfortunately as the case may be, in the next couple of days, we have a major thing we're gonna be doing at the house. We're gonna reorganize the whole shop Our electrician friend has been doing work and we, we're now ready to put the major box, the stove connections in. So we're going to disrupt this for about two or three days. But what we're going to try to do is get this out in the garage, drying, while all the work is being done. So that was, that was one of my motives for kind of speeding along here. And you don't want to, on a foam wing, you don't want to get it any wetter than it has to be to do the job. You certainly, you certainly don't want to take a sponge and lay stuff on there. Now I use the old tried and true method, very, very crude, but very effective of just pressing it. Get everything soaked, get it where the dope is just starting to get sticky. Press it down with your bare hands and go wash your hands. I want double tissue on everywhere, everywhere there's a joint. I want two layers of tissue because it helps me bury the joint in the ultimate finish. And what we want is to have the wing, when it's done, look like it's one, like a real plane, like it's aluminum or whatever. Again, I wasn't sure in the beginning when I 
decided to go with a foam wing rather than make a big built up wing with all open bays or something. But the more I'm looking at this wing, I'm, I'm kind of glad I went with this. It's gone together relatively well, stayed straight, and probably taken a fraction of the time it would take to make some kind of built up thing. And of course on the tips you can pull out the wrinkles and I'll pretty much do the rest of this off camera. Everybody's seen all this tissue over and over again. But I do like to keep it because a lot of people that, that see a video in the middle of a series and they miss a step, well, I think it just helps them get the, the whole picture. Now what's good about doing it with your bare hands too, you don't, you don't have it too wet for too long. Again, I'll do that. Each one of these joints is going to overlap. Just put a little more dope on. This is kind of sticking down now, so I can just start doing my stretch out and trim each section as I go. Hope the bird didn't eat Elliot's mold. He was pecking away at that before. You couldn't believe it. Now the advantage of this, of course, with with this dry in a couple of days extra. The advantage of all this is we have the glass and the tissue going right under the nacelles. And I don't want to, if, if possible, I don't want to sacrifice any strength in that nacelle wing center joint. I just think when you have two motors and one's vibrating, maybe one isn't, uh, getting decent motor runs, that whole middle section had better be good and strong. And we'll be thinking about engineering it up that way. We got a whole bunch of downloads from Dave Downey to look at. Again, and the last thing is just to pull out as many of the wrinkles as possible. See what this does? It pushes the dope right down through. So even if you had a little bit extra underneath, it's coming up through the top right now anyway. So it's not like it's just going to sit under the tissue and, and add weight without without adding any benefit. And I've already figured out many times, and figured out the hard way, there's a certain thickness the substrate has to be, and there's really no way you can cheat it by much. I always like to leave a little bit extra on the trailing edge and the leading edge, because I want those to double over. That's always a spot. In fact, I'll put a slit in that in the back. Leading edge and trailing edge are always two areas that, no matter how careful you are, they take a beating. a little bit of an insurance policy that I'm not going to have that show a crack or a joint or something like that. Again, we're hoping the whole objective here is we're trying to build a model that will have a very long lifespan. Certainly not trying to make a, a one season wonder. There's a lot of trade-offs when you do that. I don't for me, they're not appropriate. For people that are more competitive, maybe they are. But durability, durability has a lot to say for itself. When a model gets older and it's not falling apart and you can just keep using it, and it gets friendlier and more fun to own. And the kind of time it takes to build one of these things, you really don't want to have one, se I don't want to have one season out of them and then goodbye. Now, pressing all that tissue down. Again, I'll do the rest of this off camera. We're just, I don't want this to take a half an hour. But as it's drying, you can keep pressing it down, even wet it a little bit. And the idea is to get it flipped over now and do the bottom as soon as possible, not have not go out to lunch right now. We'd like to get top, bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom. And if you have a, an, an ordinary wing, do one top, one bottom, one top, one bottom. Always the best. Anyway, we'll finish this up off camera. Now what I've been doing is just leaving it in the wind star to dry with the heater on for half an hour or so. So I don't smell up the house, but of course the, the downside is the car stinks. Anyway, that's just to give Karen a little break. We'll get some more clear on this later, and maybe some tomorrow, but we'll look at Elliot's mold, see if Peeps ate the whole mold.
Now in today's mail, always one of the best parts of the day from Ken Clapson. He sends this for, for peeps. How about me, Ken? Because he makes his own, if you've never seen the Ken, Cla <coughs> the official Ken Clapson <laughs> Stuntmaster popcorn. Anyway, he also sent something that's really nice. You know, Ken, of course, is building all kind of models, and he had this great thing telling me about uh, how well these scissors are working for him. Well, you know what, Ken? We'll try them right now. <laughs> I need to give myself a haircut. He says they really work well. And he also said try getting them out of the pack within a half an hour. Well, first, let's get the name of them up on the screen. Whoop, that's nice. Alpha. Anyway, these scissors are, re they've got some kind of jagged little edge or something. Ooh, they're sharp. Yeah, they you can see it in a, on a real micro lens, a macro lens. The little, see how serrated the edges are? Oh yeah, we'll use these. We're going to be doing some work very soon. And I'll add these to my collection. <coughs> also, he's going to be probably getting a Z-Tron for his GB, that giant GB that we've seen. He's going moving right along on his tsunami, and he loves his stalker, 55 and 46. Anyway, we will we'll definitely give these a try. You know what I could think these would be really good for? Cutting plywood. But you, but I love tools. Let's just see how this cuts with the grain. Oh yeah, nice. And against the grain. I think you're onto something here, Ken. These are working great. Anyway, we, we have just added another little tool to our shop collection. And trust me, you never have too many scissors, especially when you're cutting fiberglass. The only thing we don't have yet we need to get is scissors that will cut Kevlar, those uh, ceramic scissors. Maybe my birthday's coming up. This has been playing with this all day. He pecks away at these little bubbles. Now see how the bubbles have all floated to the top? And we're going to hope when we pull this apart that none of them are actually touching the part. Now because of the way this plug was made, the box isn't finished and we're going to have to just destroy the box getting that rubber part out. But that's not a problem at all. Now had we had a finish on this, we wouldn't lose the wood, but of course in the course of doing business here, that's the price you pay. The rest of the wood off there, Chucky. Come on, take the wood off. Whoop, 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 my friend, now just go, just take the wood off the mold. You're pecking away at it all day. Here comes a male bird. Uh, uh. Ooh, he bites me. This oh, hey! You're going to live with Ron Merrill. That's all there is to it. Anyway, we got to pull the rest of this wood off. Just rip it off. Sometimes you can walk out and just kind of rip the support and it, whoop, as I said, sometimes it breaks, sometimes it doesn't, but you just need to pull this right apart, piece by piece by piece. Now, Pete was my buddy, he'd be doing this for me. Sometimes you have to resort to carving the last little bit away, because what happens, the CA gets in there. I'm going to try to cut as little or none of the rubber away as I can, of course. And I definitely would like to save the base plate. That's my objective here. Not to ruin that base plate. Point in time you get to the point where it starts to release off the part. A little by little. I'm going to take it nice and easy. You can see how it peels its way up. Now before I try to run up a part, we've totally salvaged the plug, so in essence we can make as many molds as we want. Now because the mold is plenty stiff, we, a lot of times it gets weak. If it, I actually could make this a lot thinner, but it doesn't really matter. A couple of dollars extra of molding rubber. Now it's, it's nice and heavy too. It doesn't move around when you use it. I spray on a coat of this. It's, you, you don't really need this. This, this rubber will release without the mold release, but this is just cheap insurance. 
it prolongs the life safe. There's little ends, little little pieces like this of rubber that, that want to get torn up. Anyway, what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly lay one of these up just to see what the part looks like. Just make a test part here, and that'll be the end of the day today. But from this point on, I'll try to make one per day, one every other day. So I build up a little inventory because this is going to fit all of the little 40 ships. I have a feeling this is going to be a pretty popular item. Test piece. We just used some six ounce cloth. I have plenty of this, by the way. And so, until I actually see, I think we're going to wind up with two layers of this. So this is four ounce, not six. We're going to wind up with two layers of this, a little bit bigger than the mold. I'll mix up a little bit of the filler until I know exactly how big this has to be. Boy, these scissors are great. Mr. Clapson to you. Look at those scissors go. It'll be interesting to see how long they last if I try to cut Kevlar. The problem with Kevlar, as soon as you go to cut anything, it's murder. Okay, now I'm going to try. I'll start with two. And we'll see how two, two layers usually is fine. Like a nobler cow, that usually is plenty stiff. Again, it's probably going to be, uh, you never know, but it, it, there's a giant market for 40 size stuff relative to 60 size stuff. That's, that's a for sure thing. It, it's unbelievable how many people love these little planes. Now, I need to mix up some resin and get the, the cabasil in there mixed in so I can pack all the corners and edges of this mold. First thing I do is make up a little paste with, this is the, called colloidal silica, but it's it serves the same function as cabosil does. You don't need a whole lot of it, but I mix up a little paste, and all this does is get the edges, corners and edges of the mold. We've sold so many sets of plans to these small planes that it's, uh, it blew me away. I had no idea in the beginning that we were going to be doing this many sets up. I feel like I'm in a plans business now. Anyway, you need to make a paste that looks like a little bit like peanut butter just to get it in the corners and edges. And when it's just about the consistency of peanut butter and it won't fall off, see how it just sticks? And you're just about right. That's just about what we want to have right there. To show it. So you can mix this paste up, you can mix it in a jar, it doesn't even matter. Always mix the resin, this is West Systems 125 Pro Set. It's a little bit stronger than the stuff we use for fiberglassing. It's a different color to it too. We could dye this, for instance, if we knew this was going to be a white aeroplane. We could make the cowling white or yellow or blue or any other. I think we have about 15 different colors up there of dye. Now with the silica, this is the stuff that looks like paste. I want to get it down in the corners, down in all the edges. Like around the nose section here. Now we'll find out if we're going to have to, sometimes you have to put some lightweight cloth in here. If it's got a complex shape, the lightweight cloth is a good idea. We'll find out. We'll actually use this for a test, so we'll find out. You can actually just use your fingers to put it down in place. And when you think of how many nobler cowlings we've sold over the years, it that's unbelievable that we're still selling them. Out of that same original, well, we had four molds at one time. Now the last little thing, before we put the second layer in, is to make sure all the edges and corners are filled with that silica. Otherwise you get, sometimes you get lousy edges. Now we put the second layer in, the idea is, I have enough resin in here, that I'm going to try not to use any more resin. So I'd like the last layer to be as dry as possible. And if I put, if I have too much in there, it's just going to add weight. And we can keep this part nice and light and just as strong without that extra resin. 
just using a padding method. Working it up, and this is a small part anybody, believe me, believe me, anybody that's interested in molding. And we could do this for anybody that has a custom plane, if you want, like Kent Tyser was going to make one at one time, and <coughs> Kent, you, you punked out on me. But then the other people that make the plane, yeah, because Elliot's done this, now anybody else, and there's apparently a couple of guys in England already have these little striggers built. Or like the cardinal thing from Mike's plane. So we don't want to add any more resin. In fact, we have a little bit more than I would like to have in there, but it won't matter. We have a little material to sand down. Now, when this is pulled out of the mold, which will be tomorrow, what we'll do is we'll grind it on a, the belt sander, and then this needs to get mounted to a piece of 64th plywood to give that nice straight edge. Yeah, for a first test part, I think this is going to be fine, and we'll get a look at this tomorrow. Actually, we're at the end of this work day right now. Got a lot of little things going on here. Dope drying. We're waiting to rip our shop apart for the electrician. As soon as he, as soon as he decides he's going to pull the ceiling down and pull the floors apart, I don't know what he's going to do. Tonight, this this has really dried up nice. It's been outside for a day. It's been up by a heating vent for a while. And one of the tricks to getting the finish real nice is when the, when the plane has maybe two or three coats of dope on it and it's totally dry and it's powdering off, remember that thing, powder, then I don't want to use a sanding block. I just want to use my bare hand and just scuff it. And what it does, it takes up all the joints, all the little high spots, this is not like a real sanding, this is just a, uh, what shall we call it? We're just taking out the wrinkles. This is an important step and I didn't want to leave this out. Because what I'm going to do then tonight, after I'm all done sanding this, and this will, well, maybe a couple hours or so, what I'm going to do is try to get another couple of coats of dope on it. And get ready, see how that powder's off? Get ready to start building up that shine. I don't really have enough dope on here to really get a block and grind down, but what I'm doing is just lightly, ever so lightly sanding and using my hand to find the bad spots, and there's one right there, and just very, very carefully. And I don't want to sand through the tissue. If I do, I have to make a patch. But when you only have about two or three coats of dope on, you can find all these little spots. And typically they'll be by joints or with tissue overlap. So let me show this. Out on a tip, we had a couple of wrinkles. They'll come right out. But I don't want to go through the tissue. This is just like just a dusting. And this is one of the steps I feel you really should never leave out. Otherwise, you're just building up mountains of paint on there for nothing. The step is going to be to get some more dope on that. It's the first of many days of my shop becoming a, uh, a disaster area. We are totally redoing the electricity in this whole part of the house, upgrading the 220, 200 amps, and for the next couple of days this is going to be our major, the thrust of what we're doing. Now a quick tip from John Poff here who downloaded this, I guess, somewhere off the internet, but kind of a cool thing if you're looking for a quick way to lay out stars without having to do all the back masking. You look at that, it's really just three triangles. Kind of a neat way to do it. Now we got our stuff from Warren Walker today. This is really funny. Well, it, of course, he, he let my horns go to the back burner so he could, he could attend with this, this not so well known Mr. George Bush, our president. Anyway, Warren, he really, he really wanted me to know that, and there's Warren, of course, that he really was there, and that's why my horns are eight. Anyway, he also sent some nice pictures from, from his home, and Karen loves this stuff. Whoop. 
What woman out there doesn't want to have a nice big house with a modeling shop? Warren, I got to tell you, I've seen your machine shop. I've seen your house. Absolutely outstanding. And Karen, Karen had reviewed these pickles. Barry Warren also sent us another jar of those fabulous pickles and the pickle recipe. Warren, what you need is some pictures of. <laughs> looks like poops, peep, peeps, little poop on your thing there. Look at this house. Oh man, this is the kind of stuff Karen likes. These, these all these big let's chandeliers. Beautiful home. Sure, I am totally impressed. As always, totally impressed. And I gotta go look at that book. This box is so big, it, it must have. This is his mom's painting. It must have. And by the way, Warren, just so you know, that note is still on Peeps' cage. The note you sent me about my mom and the B25. So the deal is, Warren, when we take our vacation out to California, here's the deal. Where's my room gonna be? Is there a Spitfire bedroom in this house? And this is his, he makes his own homemade pickles, of course, and we've been, we're kind of addicted to them. And Lauren, I don't want you to forget, I still have that note that you sent me. I found that very inspirational. Right near Chicky, and my picture of my late mother. And one of the things we love a lot, Howard Rush's arrow, down right from Boeing in Seattle or wherever that came from. Now we haven't settled on any any real control horn system yet. We've been trying to feel out a lot of people for some ideas. Al Raby gave me some of his thoughts. Keith Trossel in the past has sent me several different ideas. Now it seems like, and maybe I'm just too fussy. Maybe I'm from a, I don't know, I'm spoiled by the fact that in the time I've been a competitive flyer, one of the things that I feel like uh, I was on the leading edge of developing was eighth inch horns for planes. In the time when everybody had 332nd, my planes, and you can see them going back to 1966, having a plane published with eighth inch horns. Well, that was kind of unusual back then. Anyway, I made up a six inch wide eighth inch horn as a test. Warren has, and this is what we're trying to do, is is with this amount of stiffness, and believe me, even in six inch length, this is very, very stiff. But we know because of the, the three dihedral breaks that we just can't mount this and hope that these, you run into all kind of problems for a lot of reasons. First off, when the, the, the two things come in at the swept forward trailing edge, the horns are rising and going away from you. And, it's kind of a, ge a geometric problem that you have to work with. Anyway, but Warren was gracious enough to come up with these little technologies, which we had talked about on the phone. This is, of course, a spring, a piece of cable, and some bushings. And Now, when you make it up in 6 inch, this is a little bit bigger than 6 inch, but, but here's the problem right away. Is that That's... If we were making a sport model or a smaller plane, there might be. Now see what happens to the cable when you do a cable? In the tension part where you're trying to tighten it, it's fine. When you go the opposite way, the cable unwinds. Now, just to, just to go a little further, because this is a key part, Warren also got all different sizes of cables. I cut a piece off each one and tried basically the same test with exactly the same result. There was no gain or loss. On, when you go against the wind of the cable, it's almost always poor. This is a part of a tool that Warren came up with also. And what it is, it's almost like the thing they clean drains with. It's a counter round spring. In other words, the spring it's a spring inside of a spring. Now, there's only one trouble with this. When you mount this, and I have a little test jig over there, when you mount this and put in the angle that we need to bend it on, the side load is so much that the friction just completely destroys the movement and I don't know how you would go about I mean assuming we're only going to have ordinary bushings here I don't think even ball bearings would help there's just a tremendous amount of friction when you bend this into that arc and I can't imagine that three of these would be the answer 
So when you come down to it, I mean, and this is significantly thicker than eighth inch. So where it's left us with, Warren even took his MIG welder and cut a piece of the cable that the MIG welder's in. And you can see, I thought in the very beginning I made this up. I actually pinned this and reduced the diameter so it went inside about three-eighths of an inch. And I thought, wow, I have it made. There it bends around a corner. And the movement is kind of linear, but here's the problem. The problem is always that it's it's not even. And see, there's another problem is once you bend it, it stays bent. So we're kind of at a quagmire here. But luckily, I've got Dave Downey. We, we did have, and I loaned him to Keith Trussell, gave it to Keith Trussell, that little flexible joint. I'm going to get the email address on that, redo that. Again, this was kind of, in my case, this was one of the things I was hoping was going to be a little bit easier than what we've anticipated. And I basically spent the whole day while the electricians were here. And they've been beating the hell out of my house, believe me, my shop. And Chickie's been locked in a cage all day. And, oh, man, I think these guys drink beer before they come on a job, too. It's but Anyway, something we needed to do since the fire. But we're still looking to, with all this, and Warren, I want to thank you a whole lot, but it looks like on this type of thing, it looks like I'm going to be trying other alternatives, and even if I have to hold up the project for a while, because I really feel like the heart and soul of a control, of, of a, a stunt ship is in the control system, and and all of these combined would would be a compromise that I'm not willing to make. Now it may be that somebody's going to come up with a better idea. I hope so. I'm I'm certainly not looking to be the inventor of the year or Oval Wright or anything, but but I know this would any of these, even this one. Say if I use this one, yeah, you know what? This would move the controls, and it would be like a. You know, like an old-fashioned plane, well, yeah, and it would fly, but if it got wind, but I know somewhere down the road that would be a problem. And so, and this, there's, there's just certain things, if we could do these and they were both in tension, I think it'd be fine, but when one is not in tension and one is, and I'm sorry that we couldn't, we didn't have a way of making some of these, even these heavier ones, they all suffer from that same thing, the, rate, the way they're wound in counter tension, they're, they're really not good. Anyway, we tried, but and we're going to move on. We're going to sand our wing and put some more clear on and whatever, but we've kind of run into a little roadblock here until we can come up with some a little bit better system. I'll get the finish on the wing. And this is the second cowling. The first one came out. It had a little a glitch here. But they're just coming out of the mold. One right after another now. I made this one up with some lightweight cloth. So maybe ounce and a half, two out, two layers of six ounce. This is about as light as it gets. Again, the, the mold is really, well, we're ready to start delivering parts. These are, these are just fine. So we've been out day, we didn't get much done in terms of working on the B-25. We did get, I think, two or three more coats of clear in here. We got Chicky up by the heating vent, checking it all out and making sure we sanded it. Does it meet with your rigid standards? Anyway, and we will be working with that horn thing. I'll ask a couple of Bob Zambelli for one. Get an email going to Dave Downey today, see if we can come and get that that address of that company that had the little uh, joint couplers, maybe see what else they have out on their website. The union electrician's at work here. Well, there we go. How you doing? <laughs> My house! Ah! My house! And we're going to eat the man's, the man's pizza for lunch here. Look at this. <laughs> now, I know the job is going to be the best quality when I look at that pizza. <laughs> Now you can't imagine what these guys did to my shop. They did a terrific job. We now have 200 amps of power, but they absolutely, <laughs> it's unbelievable what a mess this house was. They had, they had to take some of the ceiling down to run wires and some of the floor and they were eating pizza here and, oh. But anyway, today's the last day of the job and then we're gonna get back to having a, hopefully have a normal shop. I hope. 
out today. Needless to say, this was this was pretty exciting. I've been waiting for this. If you look out on the Jet website, he's already got these out on the Jets the website. We got this from Dennis. Now we had been working with Dennis for a while. Bill Hummel tried to send him a, uh, a test plane, and we tried to look at other ways of getting a, a plane down to him. But it just turned out that it would be easier if he sent the motor up here so we could test it. And of course, whenever you buy a jet motor, for anybody that's never bought one, it is like buying a Ducati motorcycle. It is a handmade, one-of-a-kind type of operation. Now, if you've never seen these motors, we got a little preview at the Nats the other, the last year. You get a nice little towel to wipe the uh, glow plug off or whatever. Now this is machined from a billet of aluminum. You can see Dub has signed this motor and it's 001. And this is of course going to be our test motor. I have to check and see what size these muffler ears, the uh, the ear sizes, because this little piece can be modified. That's a bolt-on piece, of course, but this is going to be, and you can see by the port timing, he's got a dropped liner in there. In fact, it's dropped quite a bit. Now, we're going to be developing this motor. I don't expect that right off the bat, you know, the first one, this is 001, the test motor. But our plan is to have Tom come over, and I'm going to try to get a hold of him in the next day or so and do all the porting measurements so we know where we're starting from and hopefully uh well maybe you know in the best of all worlds of course it wouldn't need any development but if it does tom is certainly one of the ones that'll do it bill hummel is then going to get the motor once tom breaks it in he has a test plane ready to go and we will have our little plane from walter umland and i've been told two months and that'll just about be the beginning of the flying season and Potentially, if we had a carburetor here, this would be, and it, it is a legal motor. It's a 355, so it does qualify. It can be a, uh, a motor for our B25. Really, there's no castings on this motor. And if you, if you hold this in your hand, you kind of get this like aerospace tool feel. It's really something special. This, this might be, I mean, the nicest handmade. Now, keep in mind, there's two different things that I know. When you have mass production things, an example is like a Kawasaki or a Suzuki motorcycle. They have a mass produced look. They have plastic parts. They have, uh, I don't know how to describe it. When you have a, a handmade motorcycle, like a, uh, just as an example, a Ducati, it has a handmade look. It looks different. It has a chiseled look. There's something about it that looks different. Now, from looking at this, and I'm just wondering, you know, this is... This, this, you hate to run it, in fact. I hate to even put fuel in it, but we're going to definitely give it a shot and see what the, what the possibilities of possibly having this as one of our B25 motors. Anyway, they will be available. They're available from Jet right now if you want to do your own development, but if you want to wait a bit, we can kind of hopefully firm up or make, make some tiny improvements. If you do want one, the person to contact at Jet is Dennis. Let's make sure we have the phone number. I've heard a couple of people say they couldn't get a f the phone numbers off the video. It's 713-680-8113. Needless to say, so you've seen this preview on one of these wonderful and fantastic videos. That's something I'd want to have. Even if I don't use this in a B25, I want to have one of these just to have up by my uh, B25 valve as a... Uh, oh, it's almost too nice to run. But anyway, one of the things we're going to be looking forward to in a... Maybe in the next couple days. They're looking at this for a while. One of the things worth mentioning, I, I see what, this is like a separate part that unbolts. And so this could be made with any dimension that you wanted. The problem is it's not an inch and a half. If it was an inch and a half, it's not exact, it's... Let me set this an inch and a half. It's just slightly off an inch and a half. Maybe it is an inch and a half. I was hoping it would be exactly an inch and a half. Anyway, what that means is you can use all your Super Tiger mufflers on it. But it could be made an inch and a half. This, this little piece could be a separate little entity, I'm sure. But see, that's just one of the things that's unique about this motor. It's a nice, 
that's a nice way to do it. Now, oh, I see this is machined into the top piece. I'd have to have Tom take this apart and see how that's made. But I would really like to, my first critique would be to get this so it fits on inch and a half muffler center lines. What that would allow you to do is use all the commonly used tongue mufflers, Tom Lay mufflers, Brodak mufflers. You have completely flexible uh, muffler supply. That is nice though. You got, you got it. It's like a Rolex watch. You hate to wear it. It really is bothering me that we're going to have to run this. I really just want to just polish it or something and hang it on a wall. That is, and I really do appreciate things like Ducatis that, that sometimes it goes over somebody's head just how nice something is. They just don't even appreciate it. Or they're attracted to a plastic part or something that's shiny, but it's not, it doesn't have a tool room look. This is, this is really a, a piece of tool room here. What we've been doing while the, while the electricians have been working on the house, we've been laying up wall molds. And this is one of the things, you know, everybody, I guess a lot of people have asked me, you know, and I, I really don't even know how to answer this, is, you know, it's like, how much of the day do you spend doing this molding stuff? Well, typically about four hours. I spend about four hours every day making what I call inventory, whatever parts we're kind of low on. And then at the other four hours, it's usually answering a phone from one to five and trying to work on the models and talk to President Nixon. But it's really nice in the beginning of the day, especially this way. We have a new mold that we've been working on. And this is one I made with some black resin. Put some black dye in the resin just so I could see how the, it was picking up the imprint. And we've done, see now you can see the little, the little errors there, the little bubbles. Well, that's, that's part of running a new mold. You have to find out where you need to pack the mold more. Now what, in this case, when we make some orties, I'll lay a piece, I'm going to try laying a piece of carbon fiber toe around there as a way of filling that. Again, each time you do them, you learn little things. These are little molds that, this one here we've made a million times already. This one is kind of nice. You know, you always get little pieces like that you could fill it in with Bondo, CA, anything. But what's nice is going through and getting all these molds pulled apart. And the Noble mold, we every day have to make one of them. The Cardinal mold, this has been one of the better ones. And of course the landing gear. So if I get my four hours done, what I'm going to try to do is maybe sand out and get, we have, and it's an exceptional day. It is an unbelievable day. We're going to try to get some clear sprayed on that wing. Now it's, I'm at the point now where I've got enough clear on it that I can sand it, if I can get the time to sand it today, and maybe get a coat sprayed, and maybe if Mikey's around, get some clear on his, uh, on Miss, Miss Jamie. We'll see how this day pans out after we load up the moles. Because this wing has been sitting for two or three days, it is just sanding out like butter. I, I am so impressed with Brodak. I'm always impressed with Brodak, though, because I'm prejudiced, that's all. Simple as that. I like having a front row plane every year without all the extra work and waiting and everything. But anyway, this is going to be the last coat of clear that we've brushed on and we're going to start spraying. may even get a coat on today or tomorrow. But it's that old test. When you see powder, that's what separates a quality product from, I don't know, watered down dish water or whatever. But I wish you could see up close just how this dope just powders off. That's two or three days old now, two days old. Our double tissue joints are, or our double tissue in the middle here, sands right out. When you run your hand over this, you can, well, you can just feel it. As soon as I gets a coat of silver on, I'm sure that's going to be gone. But that powder, boy, when, that, when it's powdering off, yeah, that is, that is, that's what my Paul Walker said makes model building fun. It's fun to build models again. But when I think of in the past how long I used to wait for dope to dry. And so it came to be that in the middle of January, the end of January, we get a day where it's 70 degrees here in Anaheim. Holy crow. We should be flying, Mike. Yes. We should be. Oh, what a day. I have a feeling tomorrow when we're done with that floor, we're going to be up there four-stroking up the club field. <laughs> You make sure you bring that plane tomorrow. It'll be there. All right. You need gas or anything? No. 
All right. Well, I'm, I'm dying a fly. Just a couple pilots. Okay. Now, while we're doing this, Mike's got the... We're pretty much set here to get the clear on this. Nothing exciting happening here other than the, the ordinary. This will be ready. Oh, boy. One by one, the projects are all coming in. Now, if we get done, I'm not done sanding that wing out yet. Trying to use this day to get Mike's clear on, because Mike clear is really no rush on. And Monday, we have an appointment at Servo Meter to go up there and check out all their little universal joints. Painted while we're out here. <laughs> How about your car? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, we have a lot of things that could be painted. Oh. Um. I don't know. I love Brodak dope. Fiberglass cowling and Brodak dope. Anyway, we look like we're going to be, be able to get a lot of clear on today. What weather? It's Anaheim. Just keep painting, baby. You're not going to have another day like this for a long time. Tomorrow. <laughs> this plane will be done today, not tomorrow. All right. <laughs> All right, she's looking good, Mike. Just let that all dry up. Two great tips if you're going to spray a foam wing. See so how I have the, the push rod taped off because what happens as you spray and thin it gets down in the foam and this whole section could melt out. Flip it over, Mike. And then the tip weight box where we don't want it. It's already coming up. Look at this. Sloppy job. We don't want any any clear getting down there. So while we have this nice day, it's so nice he's taking a bath. Hey! Hey! Jeez! <laughs> <laughs> He's taking a... Believe this guy. We're going to get some clear on this. Mike's plane is drying. What a day this has been. Just unbelievable. What a day. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to be able to get a coat on this. Just hold it so the sun is shining on it. It'll help it dry. Yeah, that right there is good, Mike. We'll do it one side, then of course we're going to flip it over. What a day. So here we are with good time management. New electrical service installed. Look at this. Everything's back the way it should be. Amazing. Just amazing. And that clear is drying up out in the garage on the wing. And so it came to be that we bailed out of working on a plane today to go flying. We had a, what is it, 60 degrees? Larry's got it. Now, what does it say? Yashenko? Dorshenko. Dorshenko. But you don't know Mr. Oleg Dor Dorshenko or whoever he is? Wow, that's nicely made. It's made out of parts. It says rod from number 130. Oh, oh, oh. He, made it. he made it for you. You didn't make it. He made no, it. No, I did this. Oh. Number 189. Oh, okay. And the basic engine came from Mac Henry. Oh, okay. My dear buddy who keeps me going and... Tennessee. Let's see who's is nicer. American technology, Doshenko technology. Mine's cheaper. <laughs> yeah, well, I would figure that if you bought it. You'd take the inside out, it might see a different story. Uh, I don't think so. It turned out to be a flying day, but we only have about an hour here, and then we're out of here. managed to do today and it's a significant thing is we got a couple of break-in runs on this motor this is one of the motors we're going to be using in Miss Ashley this is the number four motor that George Aldrich uh, made for me just before he passed away so we got some what amount to be break-in runs on it kind of got a feel for where the needle is and where the pipe is going to be and this will probably be a bolt in now with the carbon tank the prop everything ready to go as soon as we buff out Miss Ashley be ready to go. So something did get accomplished, even though we, we bailed out of another day. But see that clear that we sprayed yesterday? It's all drying up. It'll be a piece of cake to sand it. That's how we justify coming to the flying field in building season.
Yeah, it's a shame Tom isn't here. I'd love to love to see him do his thing. I don't want to do it without him because he's a part of this team too. So. Uh, Number oh oh one already. Yeah, I know he was here, but he beat me to the punch. I had work to do yesterday. Uh, got my electrical work done on the house. That's a shame having to work. Airplane guys should not have to work. Coming from an expert like you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. It really matters with a combat job. Alright. Let's take Put the end on this tape showing whatever we can get of Steve McBride's new Flip it over. Let's see how you did the bottom. All right, looks good. Time machine. What is that? One of the motors you needed parts for? Or? No. Okay, that one runs good. If you need parts for one, just come over to the house. Yeah. Yeah, that looks good. Looks good, Cat. I'm sorry we can't stay, but uh, you know, when you when you get married, you're gonna find out. Sunday is not your own. <laughs> Let me know how it flies. That looks real nice. Is that a foam wing? Foam wing. Okay. It's got the cap strip thing. Right, the cap strip thing like the, re the reverse foam wing or a lost foam or whatever. It's nice. Fuselage came out beautiful. Now how heavy is it? Here's the McBride question of the month. It's in a 40 ship. How heavy is it? 64. All right, that's perfect. Yeah. Let me know how it flies. I'll be home all afternoon working on my daughter's house. Get used to it, sucker. Well, it was, <laughs> it was really good. Wait, it's burnt. It was really good to get out to the field for a little while, get a couple of flights, get that motor ready, and and believe me, that is a big, a big asset. Something that passes by a lot of people is get a motor all broken in, tank shimmed, everything ready, and a, get it all sorted out in another plane. Because when, when the time comes that we're going to be ready to put Miss Ashley together, buff it out. I want to be able to go to the field, flip the prop, and fly. I don't want to spend a lot of time fooling around with that. The next problem we really do have to solve is going to be the uh, the horn arrangement on this. Again, we have Warren Walker's parts. We're going to be meeting with servo meter tomorrow. Kind of looking forward to that. And we'll try to get their catalog, get some more ideas. We have work on the fuselage to work on. And boy, most important of all, we have an electric stove at last. Now, if you only knew what, <laughs> what our deal this was, but this is this is something that makes Karen so happy. She just loves this. Oh, my stove! And boy, you know, I did a little test here. I put my hand on that the first time to see if it was hot. Dumb. Anyway, we're about at the end of the tape. Well, wow. boy, time flies when you're at that flying field, boy. Look at this as we're as we're doing this. The birds are outside eating and winter is truly coming back to us. We had a couple of nice days, but believe me, even our friend the rooster says, Winter is not over. Go work on that P-25. It won't be long before we're back at that field flying every day. Boy, oh boy. I can't wait. Anyway, we'll see you on the next tape. We're going to work out this, well, try to work out this, uh, well, it, it'll benefit anybody that's running a dihedral break in the wing, eventually, I hope. Now, this turned out to be a lot bigger of a problem than I originally anticipated, but we're just going to see if we can rise to the challenge. And so, join us on the next tape, and let's see if we can resolve it. And we're going to be running that jet engine soon, and we have a prototype of the the new Brodac engine we're going to be showing very soon. So hey, a lot of things happening. This is going to be a good year. You told them once before, so that's why it ain't no secret.